This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. The rings of Saturn are a majestic jewel for our eyes, but they and other planetary rings around distant worlds and stars may be critical to colonizing the galaxy with life, and indeed may be where some life originated. So some years back, when we began our Outward Bound series, we did our first three episodes on Mars, Venus, and Titan respectively, and I always regretted that by doing Saturn's moon Titan rather than Saturn as a whole that we skipped a lot of cool discussion around colonizing Saturn's rings themselves, or even extreme options like crafting a shell ward around Saturn to make a giant Earth-like planet. As I got to thinking about it, it occurred to me that planetary rings are fascinating from quite a few angles, both Saturn's and those around other worlds in our solar system and those around distant exoplanets around alien stars. Indeed, they represent one of the more plausible places alien life could conceivably emerge from besides our typical Earth-like planet. Furthermore, we can have rings around not just gas giants but also around rocky worlds like Earth and the composition of those can vary too. We believe Saturn's ring is composed mostly of ice, water ice but also things like frozen ammonia and carbon dioxide, and some dust like silicate particles. Ones that are closer to the inner solar system would probably lack those ices as they would boil away, much like asteroids in the inner belt are rocky versus the distant Kuiper belt where they are more comet-like balls of ice. There are a lot of reasons to be motivated to settle the rings of Saturn or any other dense ring system we find, though we should start from the outset by saying that one of those reasons definitely is not for sourcing water to terraform Mars. Saturn's rings may be immense but they are thin and only have a mass a bit of a percent of Earth's oceans, so even though Mars is smaller than Earth, it wouldn't make for much ocean depth, and if memory serves, the Hellas Crater on Mars, which is one of the biggest and deepest in the solar system, and certainly the deepest on Mars' surface, would swallow the whole thing. If you wanted to fill the Hellas Crater on Mars with water, it would probably require all of the water ice in Saturn's ring and still need more, and that's not even thinking about all the water we would need to terraform the rest of Mars. Saturn has several moons that each individually mass more than all of those rings combined do, and each individual moon would also provide more water than all the rings combined would too, as do Jupiter's moons like Europa or any of the gas giant's moons. You have to work harder to get the ice off those moons because they have more substantial gravity, but then the rings are closer to Saturn and you have to burn fuel to escape its orbit too. If you're just mining for ice and time is not a big factor, you want to do that out in the Kuiper Belt where there are tons of icy bodies with low gravity, enough for a hundred oceans at least, and even more as you move to the Oort Cloud. You do have to burn fuel to get your equipment out there, but you are then dropping the big massive chunk of ice down the solar system's gravity well to bring it closer to the Sun and inner planets, fuel free. This is a much better source if you want planet terraforming volumes of water, and as we discussed elsewhere in the series, you can't truck in water super fast to planets, 10 centimeters or 4 inches of rain every day would still take a century to fill a wall to Earth ocean depths, and because the stuff would be coming in at orbital speeds, which involves more heat energy per liter of water than a liter of rocket fuel would have, it's coming in hot, even if you toss it down as a big ice cube. You would boil the planet if you went too fast. You have to go slow, so mining out of the Kuiper Belt and Oort Cloud and taking your time isn't an issue and affords you a cost savings of fuel and energy. We also want to keep in mind that the amount of energy needed to move a water molecule around the solar system is a lot more than the energy needed to move a hydrogen molecule. Oxygen atoms mass 16 times as much as hydrogen atoms do, so H2O water is only 11% hydrogen by mass, and oxygen is the biggest chunk of most planets since rocks usually contain a lot of oxygen. Most of Earth is oxygen and iron by mass, and about 45% of the Moon is oxygen, it's just bound up in rock, and the energy needed to release it is generally going to be less than is needed to move a water molecule across the solar system. So you might send hydrogen, not water, especially in a fusion economy where Saturn itself looks like a massive supply of not just hydrogen, but its isotope deuterium and helium-3, 
both considered to have good potential as fusion fuel sources. That does not mean that ice around Saturn doesn't interest us though, either for local use or throughout the solar system, and we don't have net positive fusion of hydrogen or helium of any isotope at the moment, and maybe never will. Going from the lab to commercial reactors might be too big a hurdle, but it does seem increasingly likely we might be entering the generation that puts boots not just back on the moon and onto Mars, but actual bases. If that happens and once that infrastructure is in place, sending probes by the hundred to various local bodies, like gas giant moons or rings, becomes one slightly bigger step, not a great leap. Even crewed missions or permanent bases then become more of a biology and sociology problem, rather than a matter of rocket engineering. The technology that can get us to Mars doesn't need to work much harder to get us anywhere in the solar system. Now it might be a bit optimistic to think a base will appear near Jupiter and Saturn within a generation of a moon base or a Mars base, but I don't think it's implausibly optimistic that should be the case, or not long thereafter, as the rings of Saturn hold great interest and potential usefulness, and in large part as fuel and propellant. In the early days of solar expansion, water is super useful, especially if you don't need to fight gravity for it. Processing water into fuel and oxygen gets you oxygen to breathe, whilst requiring less energy than extracting it from rock would, and separated hydrogen and oxygen is basically our best modern rocket fuel. Hydrogen is also a good propellant all on its own if you're pumping in your power source. We often talk about propelling ships along by hitting its reflective sails with laser beams, and that's great for getting around the rocket equation and aiming for higher speeds for relativistic interstellar travel. However, in system and early days, a power beaming system can send energy to a ship to superheat gas to shoot out the back, and hydrogen is your best gas for that, as hydrogen atoms give more thrust than an equal mass of a heavier element that's heated at the same temperature would, and temperature is going to be the major limit here as your thruster can melt. Your speed is controlled by how hot you can get your hydrogen for damaging your ship's drive. What's more, those rings are not just water ice, and ammonia for instance is critical to plant-based life as it contains nitrogen, a pretty rare substance in the inner system, and while it's true that Titan has far more nitrogen, it has far more of a gravity well too. Venus also has plenty of nitrogen, the only other abundant source in the inner system besides Earth. Here's the key thing though, we don't really care about which place has the most of a given resource in early solar system colonization days we care about which has the easiest access. There's around 15 quadrillion tons of water and other volatiles in Saturn's rings. That might be peanuts compared to what Saturn's moons have, but it's still 15 quadrillion tons, several million times what you would need to fill a larger space habitat like an O'Neill cylinder or more than a billion Kapana 1 stations. So there is enough water and volatiles to build space habitats large enough to hoard more people than are alive today, and in comfort too, along with the farms, gardens, and nature preserves, while still giving them fuel to move around. I'm not sure what year it will be when we have billions of humans living in space, but presumably at least a few centuries after we have a couple hundred living in space. And as I said a bit ago, once we get to that point, the beautiful rings of Saturn would be in our reach. And unless we're trying to fuel a million spaceships and habitats out there, we can't access the materials in those rings more easily than we can the moons, and we can export those materials more easily from the rings too, depending on the available technologies and how their practical economics and engineering work out. Now dismantling them might seem a sad loss, but in fact the most obvious habitat to have out there is a parabolic habitat, as we discussed in the Megastructural Compendium. This is your normal ring or cylinder habitat, except that behind it relative to the Sun, we put a big but thin parabolic solar mirror around a hundred times the surface area of the interior of the habitat, and probably only about a hundredth of the mass, much like a parachute need not be that heavy. Saturn's rings are bright because they are a diffuse collection of icy chunks of varying sizes, many the size of houses or even football fields, but most smaller, that scatter the light that hits them. A big parabolic dish would do that too, as would mirrors or shiny metal holes or even the scatter of solar panels. So a settled ring of space habitats around a planet tends to look like a planetary ring anyway, 
unless you intentionally take steps to minimize glare and scatter, as we might on Earth, and indeed might tend to indicate a K1 civilization. Now an O'Neill Cylinder has about 800 square kilometers or 500 square miles of interior surface needing to be lit, and mass is a few gigatons, a decent fraction of which is water and nitrogen harvested from this ice. A parabolic dish to light it, way out at Saturn, where the Sun is about a percent as bright as we're used to, needs to be 100 times bigger, 800,000 square kilometers, or half a million square miles, but keep in mind that one ton of aluminum can do about 25,000 square meters of foil thickness reflective surface, so 40 tons per square kilometer, or 3.2 million tons for the whole dish, and the habitat still masses around a thousand times that. And a giant dish like this has other uses too, not that it has to be a single dish or just for regular sunlight as opposed to beamed in energy. Such habitats likely would have other large facilities besides the habitation drum and light dish too, many presumably for spaceship docking and harvesting and refining. An ice miner moving out to Saturn could do some interesting types of harvesting. In a solar economy, one where everything is done by beaming energy around as regular light or microwaves from large space-based solar collectors, you can move a ship out there by bouncing energy off big thin sails on the ship. However, once out there you can do another trick, you set up your power collector to receive microwaves beamed in from collectors near the sun and use those to melt or ablate the outside of an icy body on the opposite direction of where you want it to go providing rocket thrust and letting a relatively simple ship with just a number of packages containing expandable reflective sails and some microwave receivers or rectenna to send back vastly larger chunks of ice than your ship weighed, and those new packets of those basic materials can be shipped to you from the moon, the asteroid belt, or even some of Saturn's moons, those have plenty of metal too. The other neat thing about those rings is they are close enough to Saturn that you can gravitationally anchor some pushing mirrors there, letting you bounce lighter energy beams from near the Sun, off those and back toward the inner system, allowing ships to travel this way, not only as a return journey from Saturn and back to Earth, but also allowing light sail equipped ships to travel beyond where those energy beams originate from. As an example, a ship that is parked near Earth could travel in a direction that is moving away from both Earth and Saturn, propelled by an energy beam that originates from near Earth. This can either be absorbed to power a pushing laser by Saturn, or reflected off very precisely controlled mirrors gravitationally anchored and situated in Saturn's rings, and then on to the spaceship to push back toward the Sun. Also you can quarter light with sail as much as with wind to move at an angle. Though in many cases you will use that energy to instead superheat hydrogen or helium to serve as a propellant, both are abundant on Saturn and other gas giants, which we might use as anchors for such arrays, and maybe mining gas giants would be a good topic in some future episode, we looked at it only in passing and colonizing Neptune. It's a reminder that when we're looking for bases to colonize, here and around other stars, those selections are built with space travel in mind and thus don't tend to match up to what we would expect. The classic image of space colonization is to land on a planet and set up your dome base on day one, or even your open air houses and farms. In practice, you wouldn't want to lose your space infrastructure or presence, and it's vastly easier to establish those first. Indeed in many systems there may not be a proper candidate for terraforming, and so space habitats might be what you're planning from the outset. Icy rings near a gas giant are a great place to go for a fueling to let your main ships or shuttles start getting work done building that infrastructure or deploying a prepackaged one. In our Life in a Space Colony series, we suggested that the icy moon of a gas giant would be a good force base when getting into a system but planetary rings might make more sense. Instead of mining a large object you just swallow up multiple smaller ones and disassemble them, possibly just heating and centrifuging them to separate out the volatiles, water, and dust and rock. You might have drones or shuttles that launched out from you as they enter the area to grab these drifting icebergs and pour them back to your base for dismantling and for providing both the fuel for those harvesters and the raw materials to build more of them. Though the moons better shield you from space junk while the rings obviously have lots of them, however it's not time consuming or tricky to build a hollow sphere of ice around your ship for protection, and the need is still fairly minimal. 
We often talked about how the moons, trojans, and rings of gas giants like Jupiter or Saturn are essentially their own mini solar system, and this is an example of how that might start as the effective center of a newly colonized system, especially in a fusion-based economy. In a solar-based economy you still need those near-star arrays of power collectors, but conveniently if you are an interstellar vessel from a solar economy, that was probably the first thing to arrive in the system anyway. We have a handful of plausible ways to slow ships down from relativistic speeds on arrival into a star system, Orion Drive nuclear bomb detonations, magnetic drag sails, and a fusion drive if you got that technology, but another we're fond of and discuss in our Exodus Fleet episode is to detach a big solar sail from the front of your fleet which can expand and slow as it approaches the star and beam energy back at the fleet, or to the next solar sail behind it, which is slowed by that beamed energy and the normal sunlight and can beam more back to the next sail, and so on until you have a chain slowing your main fleet with beamed energy, and stations near that star absorbing sunlight which they can use for slowing your ship or ships, but also now for beaming energy out to them, or to those stations and harvesters you are building and deploying once arrived. They are all fuel free way of slowing a fleet from very high speed, in the absence of walking fusion drives. Those are probably not super durable as you want them lightweight, basically big sheets of aluminum foil or some other metal, or maybe even a molecule thick 2D material, plus they might have taken some beating when passing through a star system at high speeds and hitting gas particles and so on. Such being the case, they probably need to be replaced sooner than later, but they and any spares you had could generate your power early on and beam it right to where you need it, including your aluminum mines, refineries, and foil factories, for replacements, at least where you have line of sight and aren't having to do unplanned maneuvers that prevent them from connecting the beam, especially with all that light lag. Mirrors can help with the line of sight issue, but chemical rockets and beamed energy storage might be needed to help with the light lag issues and reconnecting after an unexpected maneuver. Some months back we looked at colonizing the galaxy, our option for colonizing the galaxy at a relative crawl if we never got fusion or black hole generators, or weren't comfortable with ships that fire thousands of nuclear bombs off as their propulsion method. Laser or beamed energy sails can do a lot better than 1% light speed, hypothetically they could do 99%, see our Interstellar Laser Highways episode, but there's a lot of issues keeping those beams on track and they are also ultra energy intensive, remarkably inefficient in terms of power utilization, and require precision coordination which doesn't allow much flexibility in movement. Slower ships using those beams, principally for superheating gas or running ion drives from collected hydrogen, are way more energy efficient for in-system use, and might imply a reservoir of hot gas that's still working as a propellant for a bit after you lose your beam connection, to help move to get it back. So a fleet coming in-system slowed by that big solar array could go into high orbit around a main gas giant and send its drones and collectors out to start acquiring resources while they use those and beamed energy to run factories and refineries to make fuel, solar collector, more drones, habitats, hull plating, and big bio plants to start shunning out the various organisms the colony will need, from animals to trees to microbes. This need not ever involve terraforming any planets, but it sure does help pre-position you with the resources you'll need to do that quicker and better. And a key thing to remember about terraforming is that it's ultra disruptive and destructive of a planet's surface. All that water coming in is ultra erosive, same for the air, so it's not a great place to be trying to live during that process. Constant mudslides, floods, and avalanches are not a nice neighborhood feature for raising a family. Until those tasks are done, most would be in favor of living in orbital colonies, which might be out in rings themselves. The mechanism by which plants get and keep rings are still a bit mysterious to us, as they could come from big collisions or could be replenished by volcanic or cryovolcanic activity of a moon that's spewing material up to form those rings but nothing about it requires a plant to be a gas giant or be out past a system's frost line, except that icy bodies wouldn't last too long closer into a star. Rocky rings are certainly an option, as are icy rings around cold but earth mass planets. Rockier rings are a gold mine for resources, as is a dense and low gravity hoard of material to use. 
We also might find Orthmass wards out past Mars distances, which had icy rock rings around them, and those would make it very easy to enter orbit around, then use the materials to build all your infrastructure, including great big solar mirrors to warm that planet up. Planetary rings might be temporary or ancient, we have variously assumed they were as old as the planet itself or recent debris falling away from some collision not long in the past, we think 10-100 to million years old at the moment. But that's Saturn's rings and some wars might have had some dense rings that have been around since the planet formed, whilst others might have gotten them more recently, heck you might have accidentally crashed a scout ship into a planet and given it some. Either way, planetary rings shouldn't be too rare, even reasonably thick ones, and where they are present they are likely to represent a valuable startup boost to colonizing that system, or rogue planet too as they are likely common around ejected planets and brown dwarfs in the interstellar void. So it's not too hard to imagine life in a solar system starting in the planetary rings of some world, but while we've been meeting the place where we first transplanted life from our world, they also make a plausible place life might have originated on its own, too. Could life start among the ice and dust circling in a world? Impossible to say yet, we're not even sure where life began on Earth or if it even did, as opposed to starting from a comet that fell to Earth. That theory isn't currently favored but it's still considered scientifically plausible. The basic ingredients would seem to be there, much as with a cometary body, only we have a power source at hand that might work better being closer to a star and also having tidal heating in play. Moons near planets are warmed by tidal heating, and indeed that shoving and warming is able to cause volcanic activity that jets off that moon at above its meager escape velocity to replenish the ring or move material from one moon to another. A ring system like Saturn's, especially if closer to the Sun, could provide the necessary place for life to first germinate inside a muddy ice ball then spread via occasional collision to other such ice balls. The varying size and composition of those ring objects, as well as the varying distances to the planets and orbital periods in regard to sunlight, would represent a lot of options for biological diversification. Now that life might have germinated inside some Europa-like icy moon, one that is volcanically active and has a subsurface ocean, then some of the life in that ocean gets spewed into space by an eruption or collision, usually dying of course but surviving once or twice. Whether it originated in the rings or was transplanted from the moon, once it's up there that's a great position to be in to spread around the whole planet, and indeed even to other ring plants or asteroids. Any organism that has adapted to seed between such icebergs in space probably handles long dormancy periods well. And as perturbations and collisions occasionally knock objects free, one might drift a few years and be swept up by another planet or into an asteroid belt or Trojan asteroid group. Over millions of years they could drift to every place in that solar system. As we looked at in our Space Whales and Void Ecology episodes, there are some pathways for life that evolves in low gravity and in proximity to a vacuum to be able to adapt to being spacefaring and actively create a void ecology around a star, possibly even a natural Dyson Swarm or Carter Shift 2 ecosystem without any intelligent critters and technology. There may be star systems out there where this is the case and indeed with sufficient skills with genetics and cybernetics and hybridizing those two concepts, we might be able to make such an ecology as an alternative to sending out big intelligent replicator swarms of machines, or sending colonists to uninhabited and undeveloped star systems. Seeding life with void adapted plants and animal life, a sort of intentional and artificial approach to panspermia, might be one way to make new star systems ready made for colonization when we are ready to send folks there or ahead of slower and safe colony ships without them needing to arrive in a barren star system which still requires centuries or millennia of work to make truly habitable. As newer and better telescopes come online, we will begin getting a better idea what the frequency and distribution of various types of planets are and that might include a better idea of which of those have dense rings and how often they occur. As we discover those, it adds an additional layer of majesty to these already beautiful crowns around our great solar bodies, to think that they might one day be the first places to host colonies of our new star systems, their capitals and birthplaces, or maybe some are already the birthplaces of new life. 
I mentioned when we started today that my regret about doing the episode Colonizing Titan way way back was that it skipped other options near Saturn, not just the rings but a shellboard option and all those moons besides Titan, which at last count was 82, more than even Jupiter has. If you want to find out more about those, there's a great episode of Breakthrough, Saturn, the Moon King, over on Curiosity Stream. I also thought we could explore the option of turning Saturn into a shellboard, one with nearly a hundred times the living area of Earth, and options for terraforming that, and we'll do that in a brief extended edition of today's show over on Nebula. Nebula, which is now the largest creator-owned streaming service, was started by a handful of us as a way to give creators more options for their work, and a platform designed for creators and their audiences, not ads, and every new episode of SFIA comes out there a few days earlier and without ads or sponsor reads. We also have an audio-only version of our show available there too, early and ad-free, as a podcast, as well as all of our extended editions, like we'll be having today, and some Nebula exclusives like Planets vs. Megastructures and the Coexistence with Aliens series. Nebula is a great way to help support some of your favorite channels while getting ad-free content and bonus material. Now you can subscribe to Nebula all by itself, but we've also partnered up with Curiosity Stream, the home of thousands of great educational videos like Saturn the Moon King. That lets us offer Nebula for free as a bonus if you sign up for Curiosity Stream using the link in our episode description. Again, you can get Curiosity Stream and Nebula for less than $15 a year, just use the link in the episode's description. Before we get to our schedule of upcoming episodes, I wanted to wish a happy birthday this weekend to my good friend Jimmy Church, the host of Fade to Black Radio. I gather he's going to be at the pyramids in Egypt with a lot of his audience for the occasion, and the event plan sounds awesome. There is no show I enjoy being a guest on more than Jimmy's, he's just a pleasure to work with, and for all of our Fatonauts in the audience, don't forget to wish him a happy birthday this weekend. Next weekend we'll be touching on a topic near and dear to his heart as we take a look at the concept of alien environments, from the strange to the mundane, the writing of which has already resulted in a few more episodes on related topics for later this fall. Before that though we have our regular Thursday episode coming up next week, October 13th, to ask the question of what we'll do if all these options for space travel never pan out and we are stuck here on Earth and the week after that we'll go the other direction and ask if it's possible that space travel might become so mundane you could have your own personal spaceship, which we'll look at on October 20th. Then we'll ask what would happen if you damaged that spaceship on October 27th. And then close out the month on Halloween weekend with our live stream Q&A on Sunday, October 30th at 4pm Eastern Time. Join us live to get your questions into the chat so they can be answered. If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell. And if you enjoyed today's episode and would like to help support future episodes, please visit our website IsaacArthur.net for ways to donate, or become a show patron over at Patreon. Those and other options like our awesome social media forums for discussing futuristic concepts can be found in the links in the description. Until next time! Thanks for watching and have a great week.